as an actor, I play the villain. You, you, I take drugs on screen, I kill people, I get killed, and, and a lot of stuff's very violent, but it's only entertainment. Me and Danny Dyer got famous really quick. We was like De Niro and, and Pesci, you know what I mean? And walking around, we was the, the main guys, and we was getting paid fortunes to go to clubs and, uh, and party and have a good time, and we thought that was it. And I started thinking I'm rock and roll, and I started drinking too much and doing this and doing that. The industry fast turns around and says, it's different from fast turns around and says, he's a liability. It took three or four years for me to get back in the game and start working again. Football Factory and The Business are some of my favourite films made from Britain. The next actor, podcast guest, Tamu Hussain, shares his involvement with the films, his new venture in the NFT world, as well as seeing his daughter go into Love Island and his thoughts and feelings as a father. Please subscribe, you're going to enjoy this episode and be happy, never content. You want to wait to the game or do you want to make one with me now? Right, we're back on my podcast, The Stephen Sully Study. What does this study mean? It means I like to study successful individuals and certainly this man in front of me is someone I've been on this case for some time. <laughs> I, as a kid, used to admire you on TV, watching you in the things like The Business, Football Factory, etc. And then I obviously got to know your son really well, uh, Tasha. Yeah. Uh, his birthday recently, so happy birthday, mate. Happy birthday, and, son. And, I, I, was, uh, I actually weren't there for his birthday, so we're gonna celebrate <laughs> next week. And I know, I know you've been traveling the world doing different business stuff, sure. and you've got your colleague here as well, yeah. who's gonna talk to us a little bit about the NFT space and obviously the business that you're involved with. Yeah. Um, I've listened to a lot of your podcasts recently, and even yeah. your radio interview that you've done in Dubai, I think on the 3rd of June. For Virgin with Chris. Yeah. That's it, and I thought that was fantastic. And rather okay. it being a same old sort of story, I sure. wanted to just start the conversation a little bit differently. Okay? Absolutely. So, I'm a father, right? Yeah. And part of my conversations I've been having with other fathers recently is, as the kids are growing older, I'm a little bit nervous what my sons are gonna get up to, yeah? When I was younger, I was a boxer, and they used to get in some fights, and we was talking about boxing, etc., yeah. and fighting. Yeah. But I don't have a daughter, and I wanted just to read this, not to antagonise you, but I wanted sure. to see what your your mindset was like. Okay, <laughs> you're going to say Love Island. Well, look, not that. <laughs> Me so the Metro. It said Love Island's uh, Bell Hassan hit in the face and uh, and abused on the night out due to a reality TV fame and status. Mm -hmm. Now. I'm reading, I, I've not ever met your daughter. I know Tash really well and he's, he's- But you're reading it thinking I'm gonna call you up and I wanna get hold of this person like and, everyone else did. And, 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 and I'm, I'm, I'm thinking the psychology as a father, how how the fuck do you deal with that? You know, because you're high profile, yeah. she's high pro profile, yeah. but at the end of the day, she's your little daughter. She's my baby and she always will be. Um, it's tough, it's difficult. Where we come from and the background we come from, as you know, probably like yourself, Steve, is that we don't tolerate shit like that we protect our kids and our family and our friends and whatever it takes it's an eye for an eye in it so we was quite lucky that the club that she was at was uh the owner's a good friend of mine he's very high up in the ranks of uh, the underworld and stuff so it was dealt with quite quickly but saying that i mean if it was a man that hit my daughter it's a different story but it's jealous girls and, you know, they lash out and girls will be girls. So it's a little bit difficult to deal with it that way. Normally I deal with it, I let girls deal with it, I let my sisters, my nieces, and we're a big family and they'll all get together and deal with it. But it was good because the security there uh, was was great and the head of security, she's wonderful and she's, she's a family friend and she's kind of nipped it in the bud quite quickly because kids can lash out at any time. I'm thankful it wasn't acid, I'm thankful it wasn't a glass or, or, or a knife or a weapon. Mm. So it was a little bit handbags at dawn it did affect my daughter because my daughter's so lovely she's so grounded she's been around celebrity and fame all her life and I've, I've taught her to say look you know you're not a normal we're not a normal family we come from bread and jam and your dad's famous now so you have to be wary you have to have your wits about you and even when before she was famous she used to get i do you know as an actor i play the villain you, you, i take drugs on screen i kill people i get killed and, and a lot of stuff's very violent but it's only entertainment but for kids it isn't they actually think her dad's really doing that. So she did get a lot of slack when she was a kid. She learned to deal with, deal with it. And, and it was one of those things where I said, uh, she called me and I'm like, I'm in the car, I'm on my way. And she said, dad, 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 it's okay. It was just handbags at dawn, it was fine. So each situation with your kids, whether they're famous or not, you have to assess it as a parent yourself. Like you were, you were talking to me with gritty teeth and you haven't even got a daughter, but you know my family, you know me, mm. and you know Tash. So my daughter would be your niece or you'd see her the same like we all do and yeah. I was raised. 
but you just kind of deal with it and it does it does fucking hurt it does you think oh you fucking you're touching my kids mm. because that's what we do don't we we, yeah. we put a talk show around our kids our, especially our wives the mother of our kids of we put a talk show around them, our mums and you being a man and a fighter yourself the women in our family are paramount we we live under their feet don't we we respect them Absolutely. we love them and that's what we do boys my son come i mean listen my son gives me more ag as you know, my daughter, my daughter has a little tear up, and she's she's a tough girl. She can hold her own. She can have a hell of a tear up, yeah. and she's nobody's fool. I raised her, you know. What I mean, she's a. This is why we clash, me and Bell, because my mum said it. She's a mini version of you. She's a female version of you. If somebody attacks you, what do you do? You attack back. You can't attack her. So I know who she is and what she is, and she's an amazing, independent, beautiful woman, young woman, driven, very smart, knows what she wants. So that side of it was kind of like that. I've I've got this. Don't worry, you know, and. Being in the being in the public eye, the press will get hold of it. They'll, they'll, they'll magnify it and they'll turn it into something more than what it is because they want people to be interested. You know, the headlines will always be Tam Hassan's uh, actor, Tam Hassan's gangster actor, Tam Hassan's daughter, Bell Hassan gets beat up in a club. So it was, oh my God, what more than what what did Bell do? What did Tamma do? So it's just front line pages. It's just headlines that people kind of. The tabloids do but she's okay the main thing is she come home she was okay she had a few scratches you know mm. it's the old saying we've had a million fights us and you can't go out in the rain and not get wet as they say but she's all right <laughs> but my son gives me more ag than she could ever do do you know what I mean? i'm at the stage now you know you could get, i'll get people calling me you did this down i'm like Tash, i'm too old now son you've got to stop no 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 you're all right just do but kids are kids and you know i've got one son they never leave you just the toys get more expensive Oh, absolutely. You know definitely, I mean? definitely. The last night on it. Um, so regardless whether, you know, uh, some people think the whole Love Island is a good thing or a bad thing, the reality is if you're a film star, mm -hmm. if you're a music star, if you're on Love Island or t uh, reality TV star, you can use that platform to go on to greater things. One person that sticks out uh, in my mind, who I've met once or twice, haven't got on the podcast yet, but hopefully, someone like Tommy Mallet. You know, we were talking about Tommy Mallet today. Really, I mean, TV I love Tommy. star, yeah. raised his profile, yeah. doing great things in the shoe industry, and, and becoming a self-made millionaire, and very, very successful. And no doubt, your daughter is going to go on from there. You know. Well, you know what? For me, the the ones, the kids that go in there that have parents or brothers or a family that's in the public eye understands media understands fame i think those are the kids that are probably more luckier if i can say lucky or, or more they have more chance because they've got guidance now uh for me with bell i mean it's got to be a father's worst nightmare isn't it you, you know your daughter and my daughter didn't like fame she uh, she's a phenomenal actress she's a trained actress a great singer very talented everything she was a champion Irish dancer believe it or not so whatever she's turned her hand to she's been great at and um, she said she, she, I got famous very quickly and she, you know she's a little kid and I'm in the mall and I'm getting mobbed and all of this stuff and she, she didn't like it so she um, she was frightened of me she never wanted to be famous so she took up makeup and she was very good at it and I did a podcast with her, and if you want to listen to it, and you get an in-depth on it, it's called Family Business, it's the first one, but I learned things about my daughter that I didn't know, so it's very emotional, but she had a, you know, she had a, a bad time with some boyfriends, I won't say their names, because if I do, I'm going to have to go and find them. <laughs> but she, and then she just turned up and went, Dad, I want to go to Love Island. I'm like, what are you talking about? Well, Love Island, what do you mean Love Island? And... I was like, oh God, especially where we come from with our culture. You know, my mum's very liberated and very sort of full of women and she's not sort of old fashioned and stuck in that religious sort of realm of girls sit at home and boys can do what they want. Well, she's the celibate. Turkish culture yeah, the is, Turkish is, culture is, is quite yeah, humble, you know? It's quite humble and yeah. it's very sort of, you know, you get raised, you, 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 you get educated, you get a job, you get married, you have children, settle down. And then, you know, it's very that way, which is, it's not just Turkish culture, English culture, it's, it's yeah. most cultures. Parents want their kids to do the right thing as far as they're concerned. So I'm like, Bell, and I thought the show's already started. And I said, look, the show's already, your Tam Hassan, ring the producers, I want to go in there. And I was like, okay, all right. Before I do this, Bill, what's your, what's your, what's your, what's your game plan? What do you want to go in there for? Is it what's because, your goal? Yeah. What's your goal? I'm thinking, oh, she wants to make her boyfriend jealous or something. I, was, I couldn't have been more wrong. She said, I want, and remember she's only 20. I think it might be 19 or 20. She said, I want 150,000 followers. I want a platform. I want five salons. I want to create my own makeup range. And I want to float it. 
and sell it to L'Oreal for a hundred million. I'm like, switched on. Right, switched on, ain't the word. And I said, seriously? And she went, that's it, dad. And that's the biggest platform because Love Island globally is the biggest platform for reality TV. And reality TV creates stars. But for her, she had me as guidance. Her mum's very strong. Uh, her brother's my mum. We have a very tight, big, tight-knit family. And we will support. If you're going to do something, we'll support you. And then before she went in, I just said to her, look, if you don't find love, sweetheart, just go have the best holiday of your life and remember I'm fucking watching you. <laughs> and you know what? She went in there and she was brilliant. I actually watched her and the producers of Ring Up would go, Tam, don't watch tonight's episode. She's, they've got to be lap dancers and she comes out. And even that, she came out and she, she had all the gear on. But I just looked at her and I beam. I was so proud of her because it's not easy to be on them shows. And they are game shows. You mm. know, at the end of the day, they are game shows and they are, you know, scripted and they ask you to do things. But she stayed true to herself. She didn't carry words. I said to her, don't shit, still don't carry words. And she, she spoke her mind. And for me, the first thing was, you're not going to come out of this show falling out of nightclubs doing PAs because we're going to stick to your goal. She's doing tutorials. She's got great brands behind her. She's doing okay financially. You know, we've got her a record deal. She's got movie deals. And predominantly, we're trying to push her to be a presenter because she's she's blossomed. Mm. She's a beautiful looking girl. She's she's blossomed. And and just saying that, I say my biggest fear was the Turkish community and our community. And we, there's a festival in, in uh, North London or East London every year. And there's like 20,000 Cypriots and Turks and Greeks that are there. And I couldn't believe how overwhelming it was, how many young girls came and said to me, we love Belle so much because she actually liberated them and made them believe just because of our culture and just because of our background and our upbringing it doesn't mean we can't do that so she become a hero overnight she's got she had a, over a million followers then i think she's around that now and i said to her i said what's your what's your demographic what's your fan base she went for a girl from nine years old to predominantly 13 i said well you've got a big responsibility yeah, and massive. she took that responsibility and she, she, she's never had no fillers no botox not that she mocks it and she's the first one to go out with no makeup and the other day it's quite funny my, my, my wife called me and said uh, she was really upset she said have you seen but I don't watch her stuff because I can't read the comments and all that stuff because it, it just gets to me and so I don't really watch her stuff she went oh Belle was on there she, she, she had a meltdown she was really upset and I said babe why are you doing that your mum's really upset my mum's upset your nan's up and she went dad because I need them to know that it isn't all fairy tales, glitz and glam. I'm human and we have meltdowns. Yeah. And I want them to see me have a meltdown. I want them to see that I'm human and I'm real. That's and true. I was that was very commendable of her. So she's she's blossomed into a very driven, smart, you know, strong woman. And I'm and I'm really proud of her. And it's quite funny this show's that big. I mean, I've done so many cult movies, I've won countless awards. And like you said yourself, a lot of people grow up watching my stuff and I don't get introduced onto sofas anymore as Tam Hassan, the movie actor. They actually say, star of Love Island, Belle Hassan's dad, <laughs> which is so yeah. brilliant. And I, I try and pull her and she goes, dad, get used to it. Do you know what <laughs> I mean? But she, she's held her own, she's done well, she stayed true to her show and she's just going from strength to strength. Yeah, she, so you can, you can get, and what I said, you know, these kids are committing suicide because that one year of fame when their sun and shine until the next show and then they're just forgotten about, that should be managed. That should be taken care of, you know. Um, and that people should go into them. There should be sort of support for that because not everybody's got a dad like me or a dad like you or your father. You know what I mean? That can support the kids and drive them the right way because most of them just come out, they start partying, they get on drugs, and then all of a sudden it's gone and they're like, my money, my revenue is gone. I'm, I'm not relevant anymore. What can I do next? And and then they start going into this depression and then they start sort of committing suicide, which is sad. So for me, that would be the most important thing on these reality TV shows. Get hold of these kids, hang on to them, try and give them financial support, structure and, and guidance mentally as definitely, well as physically. So, yeah. Well, one of my former guests, Jack Fincham, actually won Love Island. Love and Jack. He, and, and he admitted firsthand, listen, the drinks, the drugs, got the better, better of him. He lost his path, his way in life. And before you know it, you start to become depressed. He actually said on my podcast, he thought about suicide, yeah. which is really, really, really a sad thing. But again, if you've got good mentors, good parents, good guidance, 
I think that's one of the most important things. But I mean, life. even saying now, I'm going to be completely honest with you now, me and Danny Dyer got famous really quick. I mean, you think about it, 10, 15 years ago when all these great movies were out, we was like De Niro and, and Pesci, you know what I mean? And walking around, we was the, the main guys and we was getting paid fortunes to go to clubs and uh, and party and have a good time. And Because we, we kind of invented the PA, me and Danny. When we was turning up at clubs, and it was, we were walking out on the stage, there's two, three thousand screaming kids. Like, yeah. we're standing there going, you thought Elvis Presley and Michael Jackson yeah. walks out onto the stage, you know what I mean? So we messed up. I've messed up. You know, Danny's renowned, you know, not renowned, Danny's publicly gone to rehab and stuff. I didn't let the other stuff get older. But we messed up in the sense where we thought that was it. And then we started, beha I started being, not so I'm not going to speak, but I started behaving badly on set. And I started thinking I'm rock and roll and I started, you know, uh, drinking too much and doing this and doing that. And the industry fast turns around and says, it's different from fast turns and says, he's a liability. We yeah. can't be fucked with this bollocks because there, there's too many of us. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. it's happened to me. So I can speak from experience. And then I was in actor's jail for God knows how long. I couldn't bag a job for love, no money because people, you get that reputation. And it took three or four years for me to get back in the game and start working again. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So it happens to all of us. Yeah, I mean, for everyone from Robert Downey Jr. to, 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 to Madsen, to, to, you know, to, to, to everyone. It happens to all of us. So there should be that structure in place where there is that support system now because reality TV is the way of the world now and it is a powerful medium mm. and these kids get fame really quick for not having they don't you don't have to have a massive amount of talent to be famous do you know what i mean and and that should be that should be taken care of definitely um as we touched on earlier i do uh, boxing i had haven't had as many fights as you I had a sure. fight this year in in march a white collar you can be in so I was fighting for a league called the Queensbury league which is now turned to quest which is sort of like nice. a semi-pro kind of league so um yep. Uh, Anthony Yard used to be the champion sure, there, so sure. he went from there and converted over to pro. And sometimes pros go back to it if they don't want to go to it, to amateur. Right. So it's quite a high level league. Nice. I've had 16 fights. And anyway, the point I'm trying to make is I believe the boxer's mindset is transferable to the businessman's mindset sure. because it's all about discipline. do, do or die, yeah. discipline, believe in yourself. And even when you get knocked down, you can get back up. And what a lot of people don't realise, I didn't realise, that you actually had quite an extensive amateur sort of career. I did, yeah. I you did. Had, I, like 95 wins I've got down there? Something like that, yeah. yeah. I, I, something I started like at that. 17 though, which is actually quite late. No, seven I started. Oh, I started right, maybe I've, I've seven, misread No, it. sorry. I, I was seven, my brother's nine, yeah, then we, yeah, I started really young. Because growing up in New Cross and stuff, <clears throat> I was a short, fat, little, I was pure white as a kid with loads of air. And I got bullied a lot. And... When I was growing up, apart from, you know, if you're a boxer, the girls love you, uh, like you're the man. Um, I just, I was going and I was I was an aggressive little man that wouldn't be bullied. I'd get beat up, but I'd still come back and I'd get expelled from school and I'd be fine at school. But it was it was always me, I got the blame for it. And then my mum put me into judo, I lasted two minutes because it was, wasn't enough for me. And then she gave me to Ginger May, God rest his soul, who was, he was a lot like Mickey out of Rocky. He was that oh, right. little yeah. roll up out of his mouth. He had four sons that were pro boxers. And he, we had a, he had a gym, a little gym down at um, All Saints Church in New Cross. And we went there and, and I've, I've, I've got, I found it and I loved it and the discipline. And it started installing in me. And then the minute you start boxing, you start winning a few people, start leaving you alone. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and that gave you that discipline because I know, and, and I was, I was, I got to six foot two, I got 16, I was six foot two, a racehorse, but you have to maintain that weight. And you, and you know, it's that old saying, you know, so you're cheating, you're cheating the gym, you're losing the ring and, and it's a lonely fucking place. Absolutely. And you know, you hear these pundits and all of that stuff going, look at him, look at him, all shan. It, it's terrifying to get in that ring. Every time I went in, I was terrified. The fear of losing, the fear of getting hurt, the fear of embarrassment. Especially when you're young, it's embarrassment. You've got your girlfriend there, you've got this, you know, your friends there and all that. And you know you're going to get ribbed, you get knocked out, you get loose. And that's the old mentality of it until you get older and older. Mm. But the discipline that it gave you, um, and I ended up owning Elton Boxing Club, I ended up owning Greenwich Mile Football Club, so I, I, I was always giving back to the sport. But because of the discipline in there, it's second to none. Yeah. It really is second to none because the mentality of you're going to get hurt. 
when you're young, you don't have that much responsibility. You're with your mum. Yeah, you yeah, give her yeah. a bit of keep every week. Well, my mum didn't take a penny off of me, bless her, because she worked her ass off and yeah. gave us everything we wanted. But you, if you, and then you take it into your your adult life where it's business. And I had a kid. Um, well, Tash was conceived on my own league, believe it or not. But I was in and out of Nick for fighting. And you know, when you're when you're a kid and you're boxing, you're, you're a champion boxer. You're not allowed to hit people to get they yeah, come yeah. under lethal weapons and stuff. But then you have a child at a very young age, and that discipline installs into you because you got to put a roof over the kid's head. You got to put a roof over your wife's head. You got to pay bills. You got to feed them. So that whole discipline stays with you, and it's still with me now. I mean. Even with acting, I have to put on weight for some roles, lose weight for other roles. And, you know, at my age, it's a lot more difficult to... I won't put weight on anymore. I'll use a belly bag because yeah. I did it on a few films and it's fucking horrendous getting it off because of the food, the discipline. But you, when you've got that boxing mentality... See, I can get up. I've got, I'm have got. i lucky enough, by the grace of God, to have a gym and a pool in my house and yeah. stuff. And I can get up and go to the gym before. But as you get older... I need a PT because yeah. even as a box, a boxer can't go and train on his own. Mm. He has to have his trainees, nutrition. He has to have a team around him. Correct. That's yeah. the only hard bit about it. The discipline side of it, if you've got to do so, like right, we're giving you a nice few quid. I need you at this weight. My first film I remember was a calcium kid. I played a psychotic boxer. It was a film, a working title film with Orlando Bloom and Billy Piper. It was a great cast, and they've all become, gone on to become big stars. But I was overweight and I had to be a middleweight and the uh, director said, look, I'm going to give you the role. How much do you weigh? I went, how much do you need me to weigh? And he laughed. He said, how tall are you? I said, how tall do you want me to be? <laughs> he went, I need you this way. I said, how long have I got? He went, seven days. And I thought, I can do this. Yeah. And I did it. Do you know what I mean? I did it. I ruptured my back in the process, but I did it and I got through the role. So we can do it if we want to do it. And it does, the discipline does take you into your work, work ethic, your family ethic, your commitment, your loyalty ethic. Well, look at someone like Ray Winston, who's another big advocate of boxing. One, of, mean, the, one he, of my dearest friends, Yeah, right? yeah I mean, he's got a great uh, story about his boxing career and he could have gone ABA pro. ABA champion. Yeah, right? could have gone pro. Yeah, and, yeah. and now he's one of the best movie stars that we produce from this country. He's our Bob De Niro, isn't he? I think he's absolutely incredible yeah, yeah, yeah. and so relatable. Very yeah. similar to yourself. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like when you hear you, you guys speak, it's almost like yeah, we know yeah, you already, yeah, yeah. you know? Ray's lovely. Um, talking about fire. He's right? on my podcast as well, if you want to see it. Listen I'll, about Ray. I'll, yeah, I'll, I would lo yeah. like to listen to that I'm not punting it by any means, <laughs> but because you said Ray, we did a good one in the lockdown via Zoom and he was insisting. Well, if the there's time. any way I can get him on my podcast, I'll be absolutely happy to move. He'll love you. You're a boxer and I'll speak to him for sure. Perfect. Um, speak about fighting, okay? Football factory, the business, okay? Yeah. I, I even still today, if I want to get up for something like aggressive aggression or going out or fighting or the gym, <laughs> I watch one of these films and I'm absolutely <coughs> pumped. I'm yeah, in the zone. Gassed, didn't you? But do you know, do you know, it's, it's obviously acting. You you play a very very believable and good role with that. Thank you. But so many people must when they see you and they don't know you, they just know the Tamar who's on screen. Sure. They might. They must kind of treat you like that person in real life sometimes and yeah. they get a bit confused. Yeah, I mean, of course they do because the audience is, if you're convincing enough, and this isn't blowing smoke up my ass because us as actors, we get ink on a page and we have to make the audiences believe that we're those characters. And a lot of people say to me, oh, you're just like you are in the films. And I'm like, well, I'm not because I don't kill people and I don't <laughs> bash people up and stuff. But, you know, and but... They they're relatable. They they want a lot of I've, as I've got older. It's really satisfying in one way, but upsetting in another way. Where you got kids, especially up in the north of England. I've got a big fan base up there, and kids can't go. You as my father figure. I loved you in the business. I loved you in Layer Cake. I loved you in you know uh, football factory. At, at one side of it says to me, well, that's good that you could look at someone and and aspire to be someone like that and have that as father of me. And the other side of me is, do you really want to be a gangster? Mm. You know, I've been there. I've been that side of the tracks and it ain't pleasant. And when we did, we did a, we did a, 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 a new regional tour with the football factory and we went there and everyone was like, they wanted to be me or Fred. And I had to say, look, this is entertainment one, but remember this, if you want to be a thug, you want to be a career thug or, or, or a football hooligan, what my character did to Danny Dyer's character will eventually happen to you. Mm. You've got to be prepared for that. And if you're not prepared for that, then don't do, then don't do it. Stand on the bike. Listen, we're an island race. We like to watch a fight, don't we? Be a bystander and watch them do it. But don't get involved because it's not a nice place to be. And um, 
and it little things like I go to, I love football and you know I'm a Millwall a, fan yeah, Millwall you? fan yeah. I love Chelsea as well because all the boys I'm were Chelsea. there well, I'm, people say I'm Chelwall which is quite <laughs> funny because because <laughs> I mean, no, they go Thomas Chelwall because you know for everyone from John Terry to Wayne Bridges Ashley Cole all the boys Frank Lampard all friends of mine and all of us lower league clubs have a have a premiership club you know I love Chelsea I love Real Madrid right and um and I'd go down there, and what a great place to go and watch a game of football down at Kingsway. And I'd go down there, and I'd turn up, and, and I'd go, listen, I've got a Tottenham, you know, if, if, if Messi's if Tottenham draws fucking Barcelona in, in the Champions League, and someone says, you know, I've got a ticket, I'd go, yeah, yeah, I want to go and watch Messi. Or, I'm a football widow. I mean, I love football. So, yeah. And then you get there, and it's like, what are you fucking doing here? You're Millwall, ain't you? Millwall Fred. And I just look at him, and I go, like, it's just a film, mate. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, like, you get, and then you get, I've had people when I'm out in clubs, I, I did a film called Dead Man Running and we had, I've always got these epic fight scenes which I, I choreograph myself. I do a lot of my own stuff. And people come out and they're like, all right, mate, like, big cunt, isn't you? I'm like, sorry for swearing, I shouldn't no, say. No, fine. But, yeah, big lad, isn't you? And I'm like, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, you, remember, you're only tough in the movies, you know? And I just look at them like that. And this my mate's just go, mate, listen, fuck off and leave him alone because I look at him sometimes and I think oh god you have no idea and I have to say to him sometimes, listen fuck off mate because you're going to catch a cold you'll wake up with a fucking split in that egg you're going to know what's leave me alone and I'm so tolerant and patient because I love people and and, and you, you, how am I with everyone, everyone but you ever go out with me I'll give everyone time of day but you always get the odd one that wants to say that or do that and Antagonize and antagonise me, but I'm I'm big and ugly enough to fucking. I'm very patient. I've got a lot of patience, but they do kind of some. But you know what? Generally, the, my public's beautiful. They're lovely. They're so polite and accommodating because I give that back to them. I give everyone this. I've, I've sat with. I won't say no. I've sat with um, with big stars uh, at tables and they've come up and they go like I'm eating. And I'm like, but hang on, before you're famous, you want that now. You, yeah. And I say to him, listen, stop it. Even with the press, I'll come out. And the press love me. I'll come out and I'm in a club and I'll grab the nearest bird. I'll go, listen, we're going to have a baby bird. And I go, time, fuck off. Just give us a picture. Because <laughs> I've worked it out. You start getting out of cars with dark winners, entourages through the back door. They're going to come after you. But my whole thing is, it's the food chain. They're standing outside <clears throat> in the freezing fucking cold to get a smudgy walker. Give it to them. Yeah. Give it to him. What are you going to get? 100 quid for? I don't get it. Johnny Depp or Tamara Sun or Danny Dyer. There's a quote they're going to get a couple of 100 quid. If I can give it to him, give him a story. But I'm like this. I smoke. I do a lot of cancer charities. I'm like, I'll come out and I'll have a wine. I'll let me have the fucking flag. I'll come and give you a picture. They go, go on in. So I work with them. I, I, I relate to them. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and and that's kind of where I'm at. But go on. I'll, I'll, so just doing this podcast with you, I knew it was going to go exactly like this, but. I didn't realise... Are we at the end already? Is that no, it? no, no. I didn't realise how much energy you've got and charisma. And what the other guy said in another interview that you've done sure. recently is your tonality, is your voice. And I think right. part of your image, that overall profile of Tamir Hussein, is yeah. this energy, this yeah. voice, this this kind of almost jerkiness to what you do. I mean, have you always been like that? Yeah, I've always been animated. It's quite funny, everywhere I go, they go, that voice, that voice, that voice. I mean, I've been, I've had studios say to me, just just directors give me more dialogue. I mean, I'm that actor that, if I could go for my own fucking career being a mute, I'd be happy, sorry. I've got to learn no lines, I've got to do no, but it's just that voice and it's quite funny, through the pandemic, I thought, um, when we was wearing masks, I thought, great, I can get on London Transport. Because it's, it's, it's hard, listen, it's fine, but I know where I can go and can't go. Some places, not, I mean, if I go to the Ocean Beach in Ibiza, and I love the boys there, Wayne and Tony, and it's an hour before I can get to a table, which is fine. But then I'm thinking, so from my house to the West, then it's an hour and a half, right? And then I'm thinking, uh, oh, great, I can jump. I've got a mask, got a glass, got the app, and I've got the headphones, and I'm in the corner as I'm talking. Look, tell them, look on there, go tell them, get us a picture. <laughs> the fuck did you know it was me? You can hide as much as you want. You can't change your voice, yeah. but it's that the, the voice. I don't know. For me, it's just my voice. I mean, I snout a lot, but but the voice. Everywhere I go, people go. You you project your yeah. voice, your speech patterns when you deliver dialogue, yeah, when you're great. speaking to people. And I've always been animated. I, I think I'm a great storyteller. I've, you know, I can always sugarcoat things and 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 deliver good stories. And a lot of people say you should do a lot more comedy because you're fun, you're funny, and all that stuff. And I'm like, look, I'm funny in front of my mates, but comedians. 
that's a fucking another level. That's another art. Do you know what I mean? But I, I can't say it because I don't know it. But even my son says, when you walk in a room, mm. people know you're there. Yeah. When you speak, people love to listen to you, and you can engage an audience and, and capture someone's attention. And I'm I'm, I'm happy for that. So you, I'll you, take that. Thank you. You, you, de- you definitely do that. So you look, you're a very very successful film actor. You've actually been in things like Batman Begins. Clash of the Titans, The Ferryman. I mean, you've been in the HBO uh, series, Game of Thrones, etc. Yeah. I mean, it's you, you've got a wealth of like credibility within the movie sure. and, and and the entertainment sector. But the irony is, there's a quote here from you. Yeah, acting, acting for mugs. Is it is for mugs? <laughs> and it's almost like what, whatever you resist in life, know, you persist. You, you, yeah, you and get it. and it's almost like the moment you said that, that actually done you a favour because it was sort of brought everything towards you. Yeah, I mean. Did you say it out of like jovial? Was it jovial? Was no, it just banter? There is an actual story behind. Go on, let's hear it. I was, um, I was always, I've always been an entrepreneur. Always been ducking and diving, and I was in the F and B business. I had nightclubs, restaurants, and stuff. And uh, I mean, when I was young, I was a lot slimmer and, and, and a good-looking lad. And and I was always, I was a great host in restaurants and stuff. And I'd go to tables and I'd talk how I am now. I've always been good at telling stories, but even before I was acting, the producers and everyone used to go at me, you know. You should be an actor. You should be in the movies. You look at you, good looking, and you smile. And I've always been good with fashion and stuff. And I'm like, ah, fuck that. Because for me, all the actors that I knew were skin, like literally skin. And I understand that now because I'm in the business. Unless you get to where I am and you're an essential element, you make your bones. Your average wage is five grand a year of an actor. You know, and there's a, there's seven seven million of them in LA alone waiting tables without nice. even an agent. It's a sad, lonely business, and everyone's searching this dream. And I got my manager, who was my manager for twenty years. Um, she she was she needed an investor for a for her agency, and, and and someone a friend of mine went, listen, she wants some money. She I thought fucking agency, yeah, sweet sex, you get that walk down the red carpet. It's only it's not it's like twenty five grand or so. It wasn't mad money. I thought I'll invest in it. And then she went, oh, you ever thought about acting? And it was to her that actually made me and helped me get to where I am and who I am now, that I quoted that to. I was opening a restaurant called Blue Eye Beckham and I had to get to the bank to get some float because it was tills then, there was no, yeah, no, yeah. no one took no cards yeah. And uh, I was at Bentley's and she went, have you ever thought about acting? And I went, acting? Acting's for fucking mugs. And I pulled out, <laughs> I was a flash little prick and all back in the day, yeah. you know, I had it all. I pulled out a couple of fifties, I paid for dinner. I think that's, I pulled it down, we'd gone at them. That's on me, I'll see you later. She said, what are you doing again? I said, I've got to go to the bank. Uh, I've got to get like seven and a half grand for her. She went, I'll, I'll come get it for you if you want. And she even said, she, 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 as I walked out, she said to my mate Graham, she went, what a fucking gangster playboy flash prick <laughs> that turns up late on my time. But fuck me, I love him. <laughs> He's brilliant, isn't he? Graham, I want him on my books like this. And then they they kind of chased me for fucking ages to do it. And then I went there in the end. She said, go to go and uh, go on. There's a casting for EastEnders. This is a Phil Mitchell shooting. And everyone and their mum wanted to be on EastEnders. And I just turned up and Julia Cramsey was there. And I won't bore you with the details of it. But she went, oh, I've got a fucking real deal with us. And she said, pull the director over. I was terrified. I didn't even know. She went, no dialogue. I turned up. didn't know what to do. Come out of the car, said, don't ever make me do that again. It was terrifying, like this. She went, okay, I'm sorry, but you've done it now. BBC, blah, blah, blah. It's a client, blah. driving back. Fast forward 20 minutes. She went, up, shut the car, sit down, I offered you the job. I went, you fucking job. Tell them I'm dead. I'm, I've emigrated. I'm not interested. I'm not interested. And um, and then Frank Harper and... Uh, uh, Craig Fairbrass, he was down in East End. They used to frequent my restaurant. I said, "Come, you never know. You might, um, you might like it." And fuck me, did I like it? They picked me up in the shovel driven car, put me in an hotel, took me on set, fed me, watered me, delivered for, looked at it on the on the camera. Everyone was so lovely, and uh, and then they paid me money at the end of it, handsomely as well. And I thought, I'm going to give this a go. And it's quite funny, he, he still says, you know, Craig Fairbrass, and I think it was Martin Cam. I was on, on the camera, he went, kept the camera on him to the director, because this fucker's going to nick all our work one day. And they still quote him now, they go, we fucking wish we never said that. But the quote actually was there. It wasn't acting for mugs and, and, and you know, don't, it was just that quote, but it's, I'm 27 years in the game, and people like yourself, what's the story behind that? So, 
acting for me was for mugs, but now I, it's my happy place and I couldn't be without it. Uh, absolutely. So am I right in saying the last film you've done was in 2018? I've been lazy. Yeah. So I was going to say, when are we going to see you back on the screen? I've been very lazy. And um, what happened to the business too? Because I was so looking forward to it's, seeing it. It's, it's sitting there. You got, I haven't put out, put out to tender yet back in business. It's sitting there. Danny was uh, doing EastEnders, so... I had a lot of actors, a lot of big names saying, I'll be the kid, Frankie, I'll do it. You just can't do you it. Can't, no. You can't yeah, do it. you got to be with him. But we, we put a little twist on it. It goes to IB for in the 90s and we introduced the pills and the hippies and the, I don't want to kill it too much, but he goes back and he's in London and he's, fuck, it's still the same. Air like Don King, still in the Bertie Bassett track, so pissing down the rain, got a little pickpocket and coup gets Nick goes to jail. Does his bit of time, cleans himself up, Danny's at the door yeah. for a bag of pills. I'm going to leave it there. Lovely. I'm going to leave it there. I but so it's there. What, it's else? there. what else have we got coming up? Well, I've, I've just, I'll tell you what, the pandemic came and as an actor, I've, you know, I've done nearly 60 titles and it's a lonely space. And um, when the pandemic came, I was like, they're locking us down for three months. Fucking brilliant. I went, can't you lock us down for six months? So in the six months, uh, the pandemic, I created a, a charity called Mask Our Heroes, which was getting masks and giving it to the NHS and, and nursing homes and stuff. Congratulations, and then, mate. Yeah, no, it was, a, it was a lovely initiative and it was very satisfying and, and it, it made us feel good. And um, I started getting into the corporate world and I'm fucking good at it. I started finding these deals, hotel deals, uh, uh, property initiatives, uh, structuring deals, and I was sitting down doing, because the acting, everything is shut down. And I got, I got really good at it and I started understanding it and I thought, I really enjoy this. And you know, you get a lot of money for films, but this can really retire your grandchildren's grandchildren, these deals. And I put a few, a few deals together that come across. And then I thought, this is good. But then it started, when are we going to see in the films again? When are we going to see in the films again? I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. And I've just sort of closed what I need to close. And I was never leaving acting. I was never going to go away. It's my happy place. It's mm. the only time I'm happy. I love career. I, I mean, if you put me in a corporate meeting, I start yawning. <laughs> me start too. Abbreviate. I start yawning. Put me in a creative room, I'm great. But even in corporate meetings, like what I learned about corporate, first page one is they got, they got to like you. And I go in there, crack jokes, and I'm, I'm just me. And what's that mean? What's that mean? And uh, I break mm. it down. And then all of a sudden, before you know it, I've, I've structured the deal. Because what comes out of my head, if you listen to it, so I've got someone that can configure it and make, and I structure these deals and put they're going, you know what he's got some sense. I'm going to close these deals, make a little, make a nice sum of money. And then I've kind of done that, I've established it, we've got a company that we're doing, and then now I'm ready to go back to acting now. And I've just signed on a film with Antonio Banderos. It's uh it's a British crime caper, it's it's in the vein of uh, usual suspects. And when they said Antonio Bandera is going to be in a British crime cab. I was like, how's that going to work? But I read the script and it fucking works brilliantly. So we start shooting that next month. Good. And it, it's a nice one to come back with. And then I'm back in the game and I'm going to keep going. Beautiful stuff. Let's talk about this relationship. Yes. yes. Well, what's happening in the NFT space? Well, this is another uh, project that we've put together, um, which is really exciting because this space, as you know, Stephen, and uh, as, Blowing as, up. as yeah. Mikey knows, it's a dot-com era for us, and we missed the dot-com era when that come to the forefront. And six months ago, my son would go to me, Dad, I bought a, a pair of trainers in the metaverse for six grand. I went, what do you mean? Mm. He's going, well, it's in the metaverse. I went, well, can you wear them? Can you? No, no, no. I'm like, Tash, like, fuck off and leave me alone with this. <laughs> Stop agging my brain. I've just learned how to copy and paste. Stop <laughs> agging my brain with this crap. And he says to me, I, I just sold him trainers for like uh, nine grand. To who? <laughs> and then he, he started, and it was a little thing, like even my, my grandson was on the phone, get that phone off him, on the phone all the time. Three years old, take my phone, unlock it, download games and all that. So he went, no, 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 I'm not leaving him behind. You can sit behind, you old dinosaur, I'm not leaving my son behind. So then I started thinking, what is going on here? What is going on here? Then I started looking into it. I, crypto, oh, fuck it, socks and shares I lose. Crypto, I'm a tangible assets man. Buy it, sell it, take it up the road. Yeah. Old school, you know what I mean? What am I getting? It doesn't matter what the number is. If I can get a pound for it, I'll, I'll sell it to you. Yeah. It's just little and often, whatever yeah. it is. And then a big one comes, you make some money. And then me and his father, we've got a biotechnology company together, which is called Green. Uh, and it's a it's a cleaning product. Yeah. It's very simple, it's a cleaning product, but it's, it's fully organic. You can spray it in your mouth. Wow. And it's a hundred, not nine ounces, a hundred that kills any bacteria, Try it, sneaker cleaner, Fully organic, fully biogradable, fully recyclable, everything. So we've gone into that space and, and it's, 
We were talking about Mikey. Mikey's a 12 years old. I'm just going to give him a little intro and I'm going to yeah. hand him over to you. 12 years old, he, I've been listening to it. He, 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 Dad, I need a computer. Gaming computer. How much gaming computer? So I'm three and a half grand. I went, leave it out, three and a half grand. So he did. So if I, if I can build one myself, will you pay for it? He went and bought all the parts. I mean, it cost you about 300 quid or something, didn't it? Or 400 quid or something silly, like that, whatever no, it was. It was a bit more than It was a lot part. cheaper than three grand. It was a lot cheaper. But he yeah. built the computer himself at 12 years old. That's so impressive. And I then, couldn't even do that now. Right, I told you, I've just learned how to copy and paste, do you know what I mean? But he then he gets into the crypto space. And his dad's winning. He's, I mean, he's, he's 13, 14, and he's, he's nicking three grand, four grand from his bedroom. And he's... He's doing all this stuff, and then his dad just calls me out of the blue. And now I've started getting versed in this space, metaverse, crypto, more on the FT side of things, minting, smart contracts, and all of this stuff. I started looking into it. But I'm looking into how I can buy and sell it, and where the market is, where the trends are, how we can do it, the board ape stuff. Yeah. And then he, he, he comes up to me and he says, and we're launching next week, so I can't tell, but we will come back and give you the full lowdown on it. Lovely. He, brings, he says, oh, he says, he says, oh, Mikey, he says, he's got an idea for the metaverse. I said, oh, I know about the metaverse. What is it? And he told me, I was like, are you fucking joking? And it went from something really simple and he's created gaming, um, comic books, characters, movie. And I'm going to hand you over to the Wonder Kid. This is Mikey. Are we basically yeah. talking about the new version, future version of Mark Zuckerberg? Yeah. I'm telling you, he says, I'm, I want to be Google. Yeah, I and, love that ambition, uh, mate. No, 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 it really it. does. It, it, this is way beyond Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg is a platform. Uh, this kid is way beyond the platform, and he's going to create an army of little Michael. Well, we'll and he's 16. Mate, it's impressive. But I'm going to hand you I'm envious. Two. I'm let, 36, right, and I'm thinking. And, and, let, and you're, going to, yeah. you're going to win from this big time. But you're going to win from it because it's it's truly amazing. And, you know, he's got me, he's got his dad, and we've thrown our dough in and we're supporting him and we believe in it. And this is not something that has happened. What we've done in six weeks, it will take someone six months minimum to get to. But I'm going to hand you over because I'm speaking too much. There you go, baby. Go on, let's hear it. Right. So I think I'd just like to start off with NFTs just yep. in general. I think um, at the minute, NFTs and crypto, the whole space is just there's so much potential i think that because we're at the very start of web3 um just the amount of people this is going to affect on a, in, a, in a good way is just going to be insane for the next 10 15 20 30 years just the amount of lives it's going to change yeah mine included hopefully um but it's like tamu was saying then we've got we've got this nft project that um, it was my idea uh, started. I'd say I came up with it eight weeks ago. Me and my dad started working on it six weeks ago. Um, I can't say too much because we've not actually launched it yet. That's coming in um, a week, yeah, weekish. Um, but we will come back and we'll we'll give you the the full information. Full on it. Yeah, the full presentation, yeah, the, the full yeah, presentation, yeah, and give it to your listeners and let them benefit from it as well. Yeah, or well, even just how you talk and how confident you are. Let me tell you, when I was 16 years of age, I was a fraction of the confidence that you got right now. So you're halfway there. Thank you're halfway there. And if you've got this guy around you, you're going to go to the top. Bless you. That's yeah. it, yeah. So, so basically what, we, what he's doing here as well, he wants to create an army of Mikeys. Yeah. What his dream is, is to create a million, 10 million of him. Not, not give kids a chance to get into the workspace. He wants to deter people from the workspace and create incubator startups, in incubator startups for them, uh, incubator startups for them and help them get into the business place with their own business. But what he's done here is he's created something that people do friends and family, right? And you get the benefits from friends and family on anything, first round. He's created something that is gonna benefit everyone. There's 25,000, there's seven characters and it's around the automotive business. Okay. And it's high end. We've already JV'd with Ferrari, Ducati, Audi. All the top luxury metaverses have gone crazy. Well, that it. says everything you need to know. Right. If you've got yeah. Ferrari taking interest in right. this, right? Oh, they're in. They've signed. They're in. Yeah. JV, we wanted whatever you do, we're right next to you. 
And then what, when we come back and explain it to you and what we're going to do for the 25,000 NFTs that are going out, you're going to be overwhelmed at how much people can benefit from it for a long time. I don't want to say too much. You're probably getting the gist of it now. But the game inside of it, what he's created, the 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 comic. Yeah. The, and, and everything around it as well. Everyone's so terrified of rug pulls and stuff. I've invested in it. I'm a co-owner. He's a founder, co-owner. His father's a founder, co-owner. The team we've got together, we, we're setting up tutorials for security, cyber security, smart contracts, all in. Everything's done. We're, we're in the first one that is a set up a limited company. So there's nothing, we're giving everyone the confidence of no rug pulls, I'm here, because those communities, mate, they'll find you and they'll kill you. <laughs> so we, that's the whole basis of it that we're creating. And what we're doing as well, tell them about the 10%, what we're giving back just from the charity side of things. So as a company as a whole, we're giving 10% of a revenue share. So anything the company makes, 10% straight away going to charity. With a smart contract. Yeah, we're in a smart contract. So there's no there's no middlemen, there's no people that can get involved. You know, we, we can't hold the money. We can't go, yeah, we'll, we'll give it, but we're going to wait five years. Because mm -hmm. some people do that. It's not, it's just not. There's actually. a lot of scumbag yeah, yeah, around charities. Yeah, yeah. We all know that, but this yeah, isn't. Yeah, that. we're... Um, each member of the team at the minute, so at the minute we've got five members of the team, core members, and they're all going to pick a charity. And then this 10% will get um, divvied up and given to, to the charity. charity. Yeah, Lovely. To char Tell them yeah. a little bit about the difference between um, what you know, what your ideas are about Bitcoin. Why, why NFTs are different to Bitcoins? So, yeah, that, uh, that's a point good point, view, actually. Yeah. yeah, Because the what I want to say, the, the, the cryptocurrency is really down at the moment. Uh, and down like forty five percent for yeah, the year, we, isn't but it? we want to. We want to. I want him to explain why one is controlled and one isn't controlled. So let him know. Let him know where you are. Right? So with crypto, crypto is defined by um, like an overall value of the market and the coin itself. So Ethereum, for example, that this morning it was at about nine fifty pounds, um, and that's if I have Ethereum. I can only sell for £950 or buy for £950. If I've got an NFT, because it's one of one, it's the only NFT that I own or... Of its know, kind. Of its kind, yeah. Um, I can sell it for what I want, you know. So if you have a watch or a limited edition coin or a collectible, you can sell it for what you've, you That's see the value of. of. Exactly, yeah. Of what you yeah, do a piece of art. So, you could take that or however it would work and say, okay, well, I think that is worth a million pound. Or you, equally, you could turn around and say, well, actually, I think it's worth 50 grand. You yeah. know, it's like if you if you walk into the shop, if I go outside, walk into the shop now, and um, I use this, I've used this before, but if I buy a loaf of bread with pounds, pounds and bread aren't the same thing. So the NFT being the bread and obviously the crypto being the pounds. Crypto is just used as the currency to buy it because yeah. it's on the blockchain. So NFT itself means non-fungible token. So non-fungible meaning completely unique and yeah. then token meaning it's stored and sold on the blockchain. So all crypto is is the currency for it. So if the crypto market's crashing, then that doesn't, that shouldn't be an indicator of why you shouldn't get into the NFT market. Because say I buy an NFT for 0.5 in Ethereum mm -hmm. and then Ethereum doubles, I can sell it for the same price. It'd just be one Ethereum. Yeah. You know, because because of the the value of it, it's not set in crypto. You can equate it to pounds and then or whatever the local currency is. But they are two different industries, they just piggybacking on each other yeah it's a good uh, breakdown yeah. and good, it's, it's uh, good. Uh, yeah 16 yeah. You know what I'm saying? impressive but, uh, mate but again yeah. people shouldn't be scared of the fear mongering that's ever, ever, ever manipulated by governments and people in the financial sectors because mm. they're not happy about not taking our taxes off them don't be scared about that because i'll give you an analogy on that a uh, board ape board ape are taking 90 million clear 90 million a month for the owners they've just hit a billion but when you bought a board ape to start it was 200 dollars it went up to over 400,000. It's sitting now at 102,000 or over 100,000. Where are they losing? Yeah. So yeah. you're still at 200 and you, you, you've got a board ape and it's still sitting at... So the mentality of how they try and fear monger you, yeah. don't look at it. Just look at the first 
the middle and the bottom. If you've bought it for that and you're still winning, just sit. Yeah. Because all of a sudden, what people got to look at is the rise, the tiny little rise. It'll crash like everything else. But if it keeps crashing, keeps crashing, people start worrying. But it gets to a point where it doesn't zero or minus zero. The minute it starts rising slightly, just sit and wait. Yeah. Because it will come back. And get into this space because the money that's being earned now in that space, we met a kid in Dubai and he was in the financial uh, sector. I think he was a, a financial broker or a money broker. So he went into NFTs. He said, I'll give it a pound, put some money. He made 104, 5 million in a month. Mental stuff, it's yeah. mental what you can do. And years ago, you'd have to have a thousand workers in a factory yeah. to clear 2 million a month. Now it's new money, these yeah. new money. Get in this space, do it, because I'll tell you now, within two years to five years, every corner shop, every major industry is gonna be in the metaverse. They are. Everyone's gonna they be, are. Yeah. it's the new website. Yeah. Don't be left behind. Well, look, I'm looking forward to sitting down properly, officially, and talking about it yeah, when, yeah. when you launch it. We'll be back it. next week. We'll um, launch it. Just to conclude the podcast, then, yes. with predominantly yourself, yeah, yeah. Uh, Tamar. So, you, you know, you, thank you, Michael. That was uh, thank you very much. That was that was, was that was that was great stuff. So, you were born, um, you know, in the late '60s, and yeah. you've you've achieved so much. And every time I speak to you, you're jetting off to this place and yeah. that place. But over that time, what I like to know about successful people is mm -hmm. what has been your biggest setback? What is the biggest lesson from that? And how do you bounce back from that? Never trust anyone. I got uh, severely turned over by someone I thought was a friend and a brother for the for a lot of money, near enough all of my money. Never trust anyone in business. Um, always draw a contract up. Always have contracts put in place. Always in business. Now what I've learned is that have... Uh, regulated collections agencies in place because people do fall out. Humans are just built to fall out of each other. Envy, hate, jealousy. Once you've got a contract in place and look into smart contracts because smart contracts are legally bound now. They cut out all the lawyers, they cut out all the middleware and they cost you a fraction of the price. But everything should, here's my hand, here's my heart, doesn't work. Sit down and if somebody doesn't want to sign a contract with you, they're at the fuck. There's something wrong. Mm. I've had people come into me and go, give me a hundred thousand, I'm gonna create an instrument, blah, 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 blah. And I'll say to them, okay, no problem. I'll give you that money, but what are you backing it with? And they'll go, well, you know, you got this. I said, don't give me your financial jargon. I'm gonna come and knock on your door if you don't give me my money. Is that okay with you? And the minute you say that, they soon scuttle off under that rock. Mm. There's a million people at the fuck there, there's a million fraudsters out there, and don't look into the distance for them because they're standing right beside you. Contracts, uh, collections agencies, get your shit together, put your shit together before you even lift the pen and sign on the dotted line. And that's it. And it's as simple as that because we can all win. And never look at the number. Never look at the number. A lot of people out there at the moment because it's testing times and it's, you know, you know everybody's skin and it's hard. There's no work out there. People are terrified. The government's, you know, mass manipulation to ter terrify people. It's all out there. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about recessions. Don't worry about interest rates. Don't look at economics. You're not an economist. Because every time they say there's going to be a recession, you go to work. Let's say, you, you know, you're a paying decorator. You get your 100 quid a day. You know what you're getting every week. You're still paying your bills, you're still taking your wife to the cinema, and you're still taking your kids to the park, and you're still buying them ice cream. Your lifestyle never changes, it's fear mongering. Mm. But whatever you do, do it. Don't look at the number, don't look at what you're gonna earn. Close the deal, because work creates work, always. It doesn't matter if you're making a penny or a pound, work creates work, and eventually that big door will open and you'll get the big one. Never look at the numbers, never count yet, you know. we we. We, we manifest things as, we, we were subconsciously manifesting as kids. So, you know, for me, I always, I had cars and houses, real estate on my uh, wall, rather than, you know, uh, pictures of pop stars and stuff like that. And you end up getting them because you're subconsciously manifesting anyway. You're conditioning but, your mind. Yeah, conditioning your mind. But that's not enough now. Everybody's into that spiritual realm of the secret and this and that. It's been and diluted. Bird. Yeah, it's been diluted. So that you can get, you can get, but be careful how you ask for it. And when you ask for it and you're receiving it, before you receive it, make sure your contracts are in place. Make sure you, tr you, you know who you're sitting in front of. And again, don't look at the number. Look at closing the deal. It's as simple as that. Really good advice. Simple as this that. is the last question to conclude no, no, the podcast. No, 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 no. When I first started my first business, when I was like 24, 25 years of age, it was a sales company. It was predominantly men, probably about 90, 95% men and a few females on there. 
alpha type style men, you know, people like yourself, maybe people like me and you, uh, going out there to try and raise some money and, and earn a living, okay? So I come up with a mantra to keep them in the zone, keep them winning. And it goes like this, be happy, never content. You mentioned that you've got a gym, Correct. a swimming pool at your house, yep, I've got yep. a gym, and above my gym door, yep. as I walk in, it's got be happy, never content. Yep. Now I know what that means to me. If I were to ask Tamu Hussain, yep. what does be happy, never content mean to you? Uh, happiness is, is, is key. Happiness and health is key. They're the two things that money can't buy. Um, be happy, never content. Um, I can give you two twists on that because that was my mantra, you know, refuse to lose, keep getting, you know, you, we, as humans, we're built to want more and more and more. When you get to my age and you have children and grandchildren, you end up being content for yourself. But don't be content for your loved ones and who you're providing for. So that mantra you've got, once it leaves you, pass it on to to keep it, but give it to someone else. I get it. I love it. I love that mantra because be happy, never content. But depends what content is. Have gratitude though. Definitely. Always have gratitude. Don't contentment can be never content. Can mean greed, and it, your greed can uh, um, uh, cloud your judgment. Agreed. Um, could cloud your judgment in a big way. So so share the pot, be honest, be open, don't be content. But for me, my mantra is this, never lose a kid inside you. Spell kid. Spell it. K-I-D. Keep improving daily. Love that. That's yours. Love that. Love that. Gentlemen. Love you. Thank you thank very you much. So much. We thank need you to be a part two at some point. I'll, I'll we'll look forward, forward to for you. We're launching, we're launching uh, next week, I think Monday. Uh, follow up Mikey's handle, which is? Sam Petraden on Instagram. Sam Petraden yeah. on Instagram. I'm real time out, Sam. We're going to start doing some lives. We're going to start letting people know what it is, and we're going to give you all an opportunity to invest and buy Beautiful. and win. Beautiful. Thank you very much. You, Please Love subscribe. You uh, enjoy my if you're enjoying my podcast and be happy. Never content. Subscribe because if you don't, I'm gonna come and find you. <laughs>